actually married to an American guy who lives in New York. And uh, she was just over there to visit her family when she was there, and so she did the tour with us. She also knows the tour operator with good friends. So. And boy, was she really efficient and good. She knew everything we wanted to know. How safe was it? Safe. Very. Yeah. Totally safe. You'd probably I execute had, anybody that bothers the tour. Yeah, I, I had absolutely no qualms whatsoever. <laughs> I'd go back in an instant, yeah. in a heartbeat. It's safe, it's modern, they treat, they bend over backwards to make you happy. Yeah. They don't speak English, most of them. Some do, but you gotta, if you get on your, in your cab, you have to have a, a card from the hotel for the address to get yeah. back. And the bellhops will write where you want to go in Chinese and they'll take you there. Hmm. And that's how you get around. And it's in the cabs in Beijing, for example, are very cheap. Yeah. Um, it's compared with, uh, I think an hour ride, like an hour in the cab to go to the airport was like $20, $20 Canadian. Yeah. So it wasn't bad. And it's fairly exciting too. The <laughs> driving. Another oh. shop. Everybody's always happy. And yeah, they, they wanted to sell me a Che backpack, <laughs> which was kind of cute. <laughs> Just a little girl sweeping at her parents' shop. And all these people we make in the handicrafts right there. Mm -hmm. uh, Just some more pictures of the waterway in the backs of the buildings. <clears throat> Very similar to Venice. It's, it's not Venice is a much much nicer and cleaner, but it's uh, it's it's different. And this, like I said, it's an old old town. Nine hundred years or more. And there's a temple there. And there's the wives when we got on the boat for the uh, little boat ride that they bore you down and back to your uh, bus tour bus that they had us on. We had three tour buses with about thirty people in each bus. That bridge is called Fish Drop Bridge, and the locals, as you tried to cross, would try to sell you a baggie with three or four little goldfish in it. And I thought, wow, that's really nice. I'd love to take some goldfish back and put them in my pond in Canada. But no, no, no. The idea is to throw them off the bridge. That will bring you good luck. And they were very insistent that you should buy their goldfish. And I said, oh, I don't want to throw them away. <laughs> throw them live in the water. They will then catch them and resell them to the next gullible tourist. That's probably what they do. This is our cruise ship, the sign of it. You can see, welcome to Rick Brown's uh, uh, Eclipse Chasers. And we had uh, pretty much the whole boat, I guess. It was. Pretty much, yeah. Pretty much the whole boat. I think there was uh, some other tours, but everybody there was going to see the Eclipse at one point or another. And uh, everybody had a little balcony, smaller rooms, and the ship was a little bit smaller than your average cruise ship, probably about half the size, designed to go up and down the Yangtze River. So this is our Yangtze River cruise. We've now left Shanghai, flown into, uh, I forget the name of the Yang town. Yangqing. Yangqing, and we catch the ship there off the little, little bus ride. So there's the river. We're, at, we're just tied up to the side. We just got on the boat, and there's the first shot of the river looking up river. And you can see how it cuts through the hills. So it's, it's just beautiful. It's, it's uh, that would be uh, a new river. That's First Gorge. That's the First Gorge. Yeah. First Gorge of the Yangtze River. Yeah. Because yeah. when you have the V-shaped bellies, that's when you have a new. River. Well, we're we're below uh, yeah. we're below the dam yet yeah. as, as well. We had the same offering with the dam. There's some daytime shots of it. It was so humid, you'd be in the air conditioning of the boat. You'd <laughs> go outside to take a picture. Your lens would come out. To focus, and it would suck all this hot, humid air into the, into a, an air-conditioned lens that was in just inside, and it would all fog up internally, externally, everything. So, it, it was a uh, it was a problem, really. It was a problem. I had a plastic baggie, and I had my camera dry in my room. I put it in the baggie, take it outside, wait a half an hour for the camera to warm up, take it out of the baggie, then I was free to go. I could take as many pictures as I want. Go back into the boat. The camera has to go back in the baggie after it's dried out, when you're taking it back out. You really had to ha think it through. Or you get lint, and it was, it was, it was not tough on it. It was definitely hot at the time. <clears throat> if you're going to go to China, go in, the, in this part of China, go do the Yangtze River. Do it like in the fall, October, or maybe of October into September. Be a lot more comfortable, or maybe April or May, same thing. But this is the hottest time. Everybody's going, don't go then, it's too hot. But I said, we got no choice. There's an eclipse, and we have to go at that time. So. 
Was it for everybody? This is for the, there's a, like, a, like, it was 90 of us or so, and yeah, we had the one national guide, and then every time we came to a new town or new city, they would assign you a local guide. So each bus would have a local guide. So that's the way they worked it, and they would give you the local knowledge and show you the stuff and everything else, and deal with the, and the bus companies were all prearranged. It was actually pretty, for, from a tourist point of view, it was very, very straightforward. But the cruise line bent over backwards, and the food was fabulous on the boat. Yeah. It was really good. There's some pictures of the gorges. Quite a current here. And there was lots of stuff, lots of debris coming down the river. You'd see lots of shoes, sandals floating down the river. And basketballs and basketballs. volleyballs. We think they're being flooded or something, or they're just dumping the garbage into the river. No, there'd been a, there'd been a flood in Chongqing about... Uh, uh, 10 days before and the water had gotten down this far and uh, literally when a big flood goes through a small town everybody loses their shoes mm -hmm. their yeah, foam flippy cool. flops so we, every time you went around a corner there was another spectacular view this is on the top upper deck of the boat once it got to be evening it got to be a little more comfortable to be out. And the sun was pretty hard on the top of the head, especially around the air. I said every time we're on the corner, this, is this the roadway? Yeah, there is a roadway there. The roadway. Roadways are just carved along the hill. Yeah. There's a spe you know, spectacular drop into the river as it cuts through the uh, mountains. Here's the roadway. You see the bridge? The roadway is working its way along the gorge. <coughs> And there's the dam, the Three Gorges Dam. Everybody's familiar with the Three Gorges, Gorges Dam? Question? Okay. This is the lock system. We're going to go up the locks. Our ship's now anchored below the locks, and our bus has taken us up, and we cross over top of the locks, and this is the lock system that brings you up to the upper level of the river. There are five levels. Five levels of lock. I think it's with about a 15 meter drop on each level. On something. each level, yeah. It's quite large. That's looking down river. There's the dam. These are the powerhouses. Uh, they're powerhouses of both sides, and they have plans to fill in the this area here with more powerhouses. Um, and to get some scale, we'll have to show you the next slide. There you go. There are the stairs to go from the bottom to the top. And yeah, that's stairwells, they eh? going up each level. Each one is a... Is a, is a is full a story. Level. So, yeah, full story, so that's how many stories to get. There, there was also a full-size truck right about there. That's for electric power generation for most cities. Yeah, it's the biggest dam in the world, yeah. and the biggest power producer in the world. How does it compare with the Osborne Dam? And, and oh, it, the Osborne Dam doesn't even come to a few percent. Yeah. This is huge. It's just like three times bigger, bigger than the biggest dam, uh, the next biggest dam in the world. So we've locked up down, I believe, and uh, we're heading up river. And like I said, every time you go, there's a spectacular view. There's a village along the side. Some of these have been created recently because they've moved everybody. Now this part of the river has been flooded. And, uh, and so they've had to move everybody and relocate. Some people are relocated on the banks. Other people have been relocated far away. Is that a concern? Could there be a mudslide there with those buildings? If there's a big drought for No. No, it's, it's all rock mostly. Yeah. This is the high water mark along here, and that is a good uh, 20 meters or so. Yeah, at least that much. You can see the high water yeah. mark there, too. I think that's iron ore. You can see the orangey color coming down the river. Now there's a tributary, many, there's many tributaries in the Yangtze. The tributary is the water's green instead of being brown from, the, from not having floods or anything. And they took us on a tour of this tributary and it turns into a little, uh, little almost like a, a small river, very shallow. And they took us up on a little trip that they, they pull us up the, the river and uh, really, really beautiful. So this is, was that trip up there. <coughs> on a smaller boat. Did the water get up in that high? Oh yeah, yeah. in the spring. Oh, yeah. That's our national guide, Shan. But, uh, like we said, she lives in New York City. I've never seen Mike smile so much. Because <laughs> I was on vacation. Yeah, she was lovely. <laughs> Another uh, beautiful shot of the mountains. 
Straight walls right into the river as we were working our way up. Great yeah. echoes. So, so does that river fall, follow a fault line? That's a good question. Uh, I think it's a, I think it's the same as the uh, Grand Canyon. It's just eroded into the limestone. Yeah, I suppose it's all limestone. Now, you were born in China, weren't you? Yeah, they were. In fact, they were born up at the Yangtze River at, in Kyukyang in the village of Kuling. Okay. And, that's uh, Bob's house right there. Yeah. <laughs> up in the mountains, above the gorge, and people used to come from Shanghai to get away from the, from the heat in the summertime in Shanghai to go up to Kuling. Yeah. So my, my dad had, my grandfather had a, a farm and a hotel and a canning factory and he was... That's the name Cooling. What? Just, that's the name Cooling. Cooling. Yeah. Well, Cooling was actually a pretty settlement out there. Yeah. He was kid. And they took us to another little tour in the morning and uh, it was about all you could stand, but depending on back to the boat, you were glad to be back in the air. This is, they called it the ghost city, where uh, people were supposed to have gone, uh, where their souls are supposed to have gone, basically. And I think they, a lot of this was torn down when Mao was in, because there was none of the religious stuff was allowed. And then once he was gone, and uh, they they started rebuilding this stuff, they were allowed to rebuild. This is a snack. Mm. Lizard. Mm. Mm. Barbecue lizards. Those are not grasshoppers. <laughs> and the locals go out and jog on it. Yeah, but slippery too. They, they, they rock. Yeah. Them. So many people walk on them. They're not square anymore. They're actually slopes. So for yeah. people walking up and down. That's well, three of us there, and some of our group standing here getting ready to go hiking. Chinese flag with the back, you know, with the wall in the background. <clears throat> you see the people. And they would try and get you in here when it wasn't so busy as well. We went late, late in the day. They said there'll be less people. If you go there in the mornings, it'll be packed. You know, it won't be very fun at all. So. Yeah, it's... This was a steep portion. You went up towards the steep area, wasn't it? That was a, yeah. I think so. And you can see how it winds its way along the hill. You get some great views from the top of the hills, though. It's just wonderful. This has been restored. A lot of it has it on, so... And you see the highway. You drove up that highway down the valley below. And, and that's it. And I have one demo to show you. Just, uh, it's a really cool program called Wind Eclipse. And it, uh, we can look at some eclipses on here. Anybody ever seen this program before? Here we go. Oh, let's go uh -huh. Okay. So this has just been set. It'll it'll uh, stop and then uh, let's start it on. So this is basically the eclipse that happened that we went to see. And we'll look at one other afterwards. But. Uh, you so see the shadow moving across? This is the view from the sun. Bingo. That's where we are. China and over the ocean. The people in the boats actually that did ocean cruises to see this thing actually did get to see it. The full thing as well. And there you go. This program is uh, free off the internet if, you want, if you're interested in eclipses. And you can check different views. Uh, I just want to show you, I want to move forward in time here to... Uh, 2017, we have one coming through here, or at least in North America. I was looking at this one the other day. We've already got our field picked out. Yep. <laughs> here, Indy? Uh, Tennessee. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Starts off in Oregon, ends up in uh, South Carolina. The maximum eclipse is maybe about here. Right at the field we picked out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was looking at Rose, it, uh, Nashville, Tennessee is right on, not on, on the center line, but it's in the eclipse zone, the total zone. So okay. go this to field has a little, on the edge of a little lake, and it's right on the cross of max totality on the center. Right. The other uh, thing is you want roadways to go east and west, and uh, from that aspect, St. Louis, Missouri would be good. Uh, Nashville's good because you can come back about 200 kilometers towards Knoxville, Tennessee, and, and that the whole I-70 I or I-40 is on the in the totality zone, so you're, you're safe that way. So because you could get into a cloud situation that we saw, and 
yeah, you may want to drive out from under. It wouldn't dare. <laughs> oh, it would too. So uh, here's here's our eclipse that we're going to see in a, a little over seven years from now. So go to it. This is people spend thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars to go see eclipses, and this one you can do relatively cheap for a couple tanks of gas. You can go down to Tennessee and watch this thing go across. And boom, it's out in the ocean. The big green disc, that's the penumbra? Yeah, that's yeah. the penumbra, yeah. yeah. And the small one's the umbra. And I'll move one more step, if that's okay, up to 2024. Mm -hmm. That's the next one in North America. If you have a stack for it, that's what I'm doing, right? <laughs> I don't plan on being around. <laughs> You'll be around. 2024, uh, down a bit more. And that one comes up through Mexico, Texas, and ends up by New Brunswick. This is almost exactly a repeat of the May 10th, 1994 partial eclipse, or uh, annular eclipse that we had. But it's not the same sorrow, so. Not the same sorrow, so it's shifted a little bit, but not by much. That's what, 2024? 2024. And Texas is uh, max eclipse, sort of uh, right through this area right here. Yeah, it's a good time to go. It's April. Texas Star Party's coming up. They might even have it at that time, so you can watch the... Eclipse. But you can see that from London, you can see it better from Point Pelee. It's yeah. Point Pelee is right on the center line. Theoretically, you can see it from here if the clouds hold. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Okay. You said Texas would be the center? Well, Texas is drier. You've got a better chance of seeing it. Like you, you, know, you, can, you can stay here and hope for the best. Or if you got stuff, you could raise down a few days off. You can start driving down, down that eclipse track to try and find clear skies. Or you can plan out to go to Texas and you know, fly down to, and go to West Texas and sit there and watch it if you, want, if you don't want to go to Mexico. It, it, again, not relatively inexpensive. And, uh, and there's lots of time to plan. Yeah. <laughs> lots of time. Okay. It's your turn to eat here. Okay. Yeah. After the tour, Jan and I uh, took an Air Korea flight from uh, Beijing to Seoul, Korea, and we steered well clear of North <laughs> Korea, and then we hung around in Seoul Airport for a couple of hours for a flight out to Honolulu, which is up here on uh, the island of Honolulu, and we flew right over the harbor. It was kind of neat to see as we came into the airport, very neat to see. And then we waited around in, in, in Honolulu Airport for a few hours for our flight uh, down to the Big Island. And we were going down to Hilo. And our flight came right down here over the edge of Maui. And then right down the coastline here. And then they, it's really wonderful when they land. Uh, you, hopefully you get a bit of an impression for that. Uh, this is uh, right off my, uh, my Google Web uh, World uh, page, and I've got a bunch of these things stuck on there to remind me as if I needed reminding where uh, places are. Uh, so there's the uh, kind of airplane we're uh, flying in, same kind of thing that uh, Mike flies. Uh, Hawaiian Airlines, uh, they do a real nice job moving you back and forth throughout the islands, and the flights are very frequent. <clears throat> so. Uh, this is uh, Maui, and uh, right here is the mountain of uh, Haleakala. And the little white specks right here uh, are uh, the observatories that uh, Robert Jedeke was working on. And there they are, looking out the uh, aircraft window. Uh, and that's the, that's the volcano of Haleakala. It's, it's heavily eroded now, of course, because it's very, very old. 
Um, and there's a, an attempt at a telephoto shot. And you can see the road coming up, and a little facility here, and a little facility up on that cinder cone. And, and uh, somewhere in here is, uh, they're building the LST, and they've got Panstars and some military stuff as well. Uh, this is a look out the window. You can see typical uh, for the Pacific at this time of the year, probably any time of the year, you get this cloud deck. Um, and fair weather clouds, but uh, at about 4,000 feet. Uh, to about 6,000 feet, you get these little clouds, fair weather clouds all over the place. Looking out the window as we approached uh, Big Island, uh, there is Mauna Kea, and you can see the domes on the top of Mauna Kea. And it took about a minute to get my heart started again. Uh, that was really exciting um, to, to see that. Here's the approach into uh, the airport. There's the airport runway. They do not get on a glide slope at five miles out and then come in at, at four degrees or three degrees or whatever uh, descent rate. Uh, they're coming in almost at a 90 degree angle to the runway. Uh, and and uh, in the uh, uh, Hilo uh, Harbor, uh, which is protected by the breakwater, uh, all sorts of people uh, uh, doing, their, uh, doing their boating. Uh, in these big kayak, kayak canoes. They were actually going to have kayak races, um, canoe races, uh, later on while we were there. That was kind of cool. This is the look out of our bed and breakfast window. If you were going to Hawaii and wanted a B&B &B on the Big Island, I seriously highly recommend this place. It was wonderful. We didn't have uh, an identical breakfast uh, the entire 11 days we were there. Um, Carrie did a really good job of keeping us happy. They had a swimming pool at a hot tub, and after a long day of humping around the island, lying down in that hot tub was excellent. Um, we had a lot of surf because of uh, storms about uh, 900 kilometers to the southeast, and waves were pounding up on the rock, uh, and lots of little crabs crawling around the rocks uh, uh, looking for stuff to eat. But uh, as you got close to them, they would disappear. And if you uh, weren't watching, uh, you could, uh, the waves would come in, pound on the rock, and jump up about 20 feet in the air and spray you real good. We got wet a couple of times, we were walking around, no camera damage to the cameras. Um, the Kia Kia bed and breakfast is way down here, um, way down, Hilo is way up here, uh, about almost an hour's drive south. Well, maybe not an hour's drive, 25 minutes. Uh, but we wanted to be there because we wanted access uh, to this area. This is uh, the, the volcanic area. Grasshoppers would be decent. Yeah. You see their tail? Yeah, they're, you can see that this one was slid up the stomach to gut it. So they, they eat just about everything over there. It's amazing. <laughs> it's really fun. When you got a billion people, you got to oh, yeah. eat stuff. Mm -hmm. That's the tops of some of the buildings. <clears throat> yeah, that's the little pagoda. And they, when we finished the cruise, the cruise is now over, and we're in uh, Chongqing, and they took us to see the pandas at the zoo. They brought them out special for us. They, they, it was too hot, we're not going to let them out, but we're going to see, and because there's a hundred of us there to see them, they brought them out. What were panda taste like? Chicken. Tastes like chicken with bamboo. Well, they're in the pig family, so it'd probably be a lot of pork flavor or something. Mm. Bacon. Bacon. <laughs> Bacon. <laughs> okay, stop the thought. Stop the thought. So I think we got three shots of the pandas. Oh, we got a lot of pictures of pandas. So then we got on uh, China Southern Airlines. I was a little worried about flying the interior airlines in China, but uh, they seemed to do a good job. They never were on time once. Every time they were 20 minutes to a half an hour late. But uh, China Southern was there. And we flew to uh, see the eclipse in Wuhan. We got in late that night. I think our flight was late. It was about an hour late. Yeah, it was an hour late. An hour yeah. late. And uh, we got to Wuhan, got to the holiday inn, ate, ate, and then you had to go to bed because you had to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning to get out to the, to the, the uh, university or the college campus. So they set us up right in this area. <coughs> That's Glenn Schneider setting up his camera, his travel scope, big long wooden box with a camera on one end looking into a heliostat at the other. And then he has all these other cameras as well uh, that are going to be also imaging, hopefully, the eclipse. Glenn's seen, I think, 22 eclipses? eclipses yeah. Something like that? Yeah. One eclipse was a half second long. Okay. Yeah. He lives in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, 
Lord, my he had his daughter there. with him as well. Right? Yeah. And, uh, he works at Stewart Observatory. Yeah. And he teaches at the university as well, I think. Yeah. That fellow's name is Alan Drew. He's an astronaut with NASA. He's uh, working in Star City. He's the director up there for NASA at this time. And he's uh, assigned to STS-133. He's assigned to the last That's shuttle one. mission. He also did STS-188. I got a picture of that coming up. Nice guy. Got his autograph. And that's uh, him on the end with his crew. That was the STS-188. 118, yeah, 118, yeah. 118, yeah. 118, yeah. 118, yeah. It won't go outside 118. He's a payload specialist. This is Murray Paulson. And that's his rig. Murray came with his wife and his two sons, and uh, he's from Edmonton, Alberta. So he's one of the other Canadians uh, on, the, on the tour. And there's another fellow, his friend was there too as well, Arnold, his wife. So, so we get there, and this is first contact. This is Dave's photo. And you just see the little piece out of the uh, top of the sun here. But you can see the little haze in the air. And there's clouds coming in. And Not good. As it progresses, a little bigger piece comes out of the sun. You can see more cloud. Yeah. This is my shot later on. With, uh, I was using an 800 millimeter lens, a little, little one, and uh, lots of cloud. And you lose it. For a while, a cloud would go through, and you wouldn't see it. And I was just using a manual tracking. So all of a sudden, it's gone, and now you've slipped off, and now you've got to refine it again. So it, next time, I'm going to have something that once you're on it, it just stays on it. So it's or the leaves will, the cloud goes in front of the sun and it get lost. And as it progresses, it gets thicker, and the real thick clouds come just as we get to totality. Yeah, the, the clouds got so thick, I just threw away my solar filter. There was no need for it. And I just gave up. I just said, well, I'll just wait and see. And they, they started saying, okay, we're not going to see it, so look and watch the shadow coming, and uh, then it'll get dark. So that's what everybody did. They actually turned their back on the sun and looked the other way to see it because yeah. uh, it was kind of disappointing. It's very exciting to see an eclipse. The ones I've seen so far, I get the feeling just as you're, you, it's this big build up, it's just like being on a roller coaster, getting the first first top when it's going to go over the top, you get that feeling that you're going to go over the top and, and the excitement that's associated. That's the way I feel when it happens. A like good this, description. This kind of wrecked it a little bit, but the clouds, but uh, we're down to the last bit of it and they have lots of cloud. Was that with a filter or without, do you think? Uh, that was without the filter. filter. This is also without the filter. This is a 70 millimeter lens. This is horizontally shot. Let me get the rest of the lights off. You might be able to actually see something. Yeah, there's a little dot there. <laughs> okay, you can't turn, uh, turn off the emergency lighting. Okay, so uh, usually on the laptop, you can see the horizon coming across here, and this is a street light quite a, a ways off. That's how dark it got. It was dark. It got seriously dark. It was like full moon at night. When you, got a, you go out when there's a full moon, you know, and it's reflecting on the snow, it's kind of like that, that, that brightness. This was a large size shadow because it lasted so long. It was, it was what, six minutes? But the, also the cloud helped to make it darker, too. The cloud, cloud made it darker as well. Yeah. So. And then suddenly the sun started to come out a little bit, and that's a handheld shot, again with a 70 mil lens, um, about four seconds. You had a question? Uh, was it, for here, it was about uh, was it 10.30, 11 a.m.? Yeah. Well, or was it earlier? Uh, it was 9, 9.35 or so. It was, yeah. was mid-eclipse. So mid 9.35. Yeah. In the morning? Yeah. That was on the 22nd. Here, it would have been the 21st. Uh, this is Murray's shot. He's, he's one of the only ones that got a good shot awesome. from where we were. Yeah, awesome. People in Shanghai didn't get to see it at all. They got rained on. Um, yeah. Some people went from Wuhan, they went a little bit south, they went 30 miles south, they saw the whole thing. We got the last minute and a half, which so it wasn't a, we weren't scum, but uh, yeah. it would have been nice to see. But as Glenn happened. said, that minute and a half still totaled more than four of his other eclipses together. So, you know, because sometimes you get very short eclipses, right? How, far was the, how, how much of the temperature drop? I, I, don't didn't notice I didn't even notice it the temperature was, drop. Oh, really? It was so bloody hot. The so other problem. Humidity must have held on to that. Yeah. For that one couple hours we were there, you're almost like a rock star because all these uh, Chinese people are coming trying to get eclipse glasses. And it was all, they were pests too. They were trying to look in your telescope and banging it and everything else. We had a, a bit of a problem with that because people don't, you know, don't want to see this. So it's over. 
Third contact. Yeah. But we didn't get to see it. You can see it was really good. And it's pulling in a little. And it's starting to clear up. Yeah, it got clear as soon as it was over. <laughs> That's how it works. Get used to it. I wonder if that's because of the darkness. Uh, yeah, it, part it of it, but partly was just the storm system going through. Yeah. Peter's been you with that word. Yeah. It started getting dark and then fogged in on you. Yeah. So it does happen. And then it starts raining. This is the same Saros, the same, the same cycle of eclipses that helped them to identify the, uh, verify the uh, Einstein's theory of relativity in 1919. Mm -hmm. The same eclipse pattern. Uh, happened. And these eclipses run an 18 year, 11 hour, 11 days apart. The, it maintains the pattern all the way through. So this is the same Cerro since the 91 in Mexico then? Yeah, would have yeah, I think so. Yeah. 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 But, so there's, there's five Cerros. Yeah. Uh, Edmund Halley uh, came up with the word Cerros for eclipses. It was incorrect. The, the, the word, he wasn't using it correctly. It was it actually meant encyclopedia. But anyway, it was pointed out to him later, but the name stuck. So everybody uses that. And uh, this is the same Cerros that, uh, that was done with that. And Edgington, when he did this, he was under the similar skies. It was cloud. He said he looked up twice to see the eclipse back in 1919, once to see if it started and once to see how many clouds it was. And he didn't watch the whole eclipse. He was so busy doing plates and trying to verify the Einstein's theory, which he was later uh, indicated. Look at how clear it's become. And the eclipse is now over. Everybody's getting ready to pack up and, and go. So it's uh, feeling again. And Alan's going, wow, that was amazing. <laughs> um, we went to, uh, the next day we went to Xi'an. Anybody heard of the name Xi'an? Yeah. That was the old capital in China before Genghis Khan invaded. Uh, then when Genghis Khan invaded, he wanted to move the capital somewhere closer to Mongolia. So he moved it to Ping, Peking, which is now Beijing. So before that, this was the capital. <coughs> so this is called the uh, Grey Goose? Gray goose? Wild, the, the goose Wild Blue Goose, goose Pagoda. Yeah. And uh, Dave's checking out the uh, bell inside. There's a clapper for you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I would have had a hammer, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the only towns in China with the remaining city wall. We're actually up about uh, 15, 20 meters on the city wall, and the uh, buildings are around us. That fellow's name is Alan, uh, taking a picture, and, and Jan's on the other side. And you can rent these little rickshaws, and they'll take you up and down, or you can rent bikes, and you can ride on the city wall if you want. And so he took us there. There's the, uh, they have a bell tower. They, when they built these walls, they had a bell tower and a drum tower, tower uh, to keep time, because they don't have any time pieces, yeah. so they, they would beat the drums four times daily. And, uh, and there's an awful lot of English in China. Shopping mall. Yes. Shopping mall. Grounds of a temple. And now we've gone to see the Terracotta Warriors. So that was part of the tour. And this is what, one of the reasons why we signed on with this fellow, Rick Brown. He's, his tours are really action-packed, exhausting, really. Yeah. And every minute of every day he was planned for you just about. You had very little downtime, which is, is bad, but in a way it's good. You get to see a lot of stuff. So, And uh, here we are going to see the, uh, just at the entrance to go in and see the Terracotta <coughs> Warriors. Everybody know the story of them? Forbidden yeah. City. Well, the Forbidden Cities in Beijing, that's the old palace. This was the original emperor who consolidated the, uh, all of China, all the little kingdoms into one. And, uh, he was apparently a tyrant, and he started the Great Wall, and he also had these terracotta warriors got there, so he could take them away with him uh, when he died. So that's our eclipse group. A lot of people had left the group after the eclipse. This is maybe about 65 people. There, right. There's me, there's Jan, uh, Mike's back there, and Eva. Yeah. Uh, Rick, the leader of our group, is what here somewhere. Right dead center. Dead center. Uh, right dead center. Yeah, yeah there's Rick. Yeah. And his wife and his daughters. They were constantly getting lost on shopping at They were, <laughs> yeah. man, we were waiting. We, we, we left here, we had to actually take a detour to pick them up because they got on the wrong bus and ended up heading for the wrong spot, wrong hotel. So yeah. they had to run and pick them up. So. So this is inside, this is like a giant hockey arena, about the size of three hockey arenas put together probably. And it's this big building. These were all destroyed uh, when 
the emperor died, they revolted. These guys all had, uh, they all have different faces and they all had weapons. So, real weapons. Real weapons in their hands. So they came in, took the weapons, destroyed the, uh, the warriors. These have all been restored, the ones you see. You can see the ones that are rubble in behind. And they are leaving some of it for uh, future generations to excavate. So if you look closely, you can actually see the different uh, facial expressions on these guys. Everyone is different. Mm -hmm. 221 BC, like, like 222 centuries ago. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is how they find them. Are all the faces now dug up? No, nowhere near. This is maybe what a quarter of it? Or Probably a quarter, th a third, a third maybe. Yeah. The walls between the rows are. Do they contain soldiers? Or are they yeah. Walls? They will. They will be uh, excavated eventually. You got pictures of there's some of the excavation right there. They were colored. Yes, they were painted as well. Yeah. yeah. One, the the next slide you'll see. The next one? No, I guess the slide there's after the next. There's the excavation. Yeah, you can see the color on it yeah. right there. They were all painted as well, which is worn off over the years. How tall are they? Uh, uh, human size. size, full scale. Wow. Yeah. This is another one of those amazing things. It was just an amazing trip. Yeah, these, those are all guys who've been repaired, put back together again, and they're waiting to go back to where they were found. They haven't opened the emperor's tomb. Apparently he's floating like he and you got to see a mercury. So they're, they're, A, they don't, they don't have the technology to open up and preserve everything, and they're also worried about the mercury poisoning issue with it. So. That's one of the real warriors, how close, you got a close view of them. Nine glass. You have, you have Mao often, often compare himself with that empire. He, I don't know, he's also very cruel. Yeah. 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 And the horses, the horse kit was just unbelievable. Yeah. So, so well done. And again, full scale. And for a little bit of money, they will let you go up and hug a terracotta warrior. Of course, they're copies. Yeah. Not the original thing. <clears throat> you can even buy them. This is the guy that found it. He was digging a well. He was a farmer digging the well. And he found a head. And he brought it up. And here's his terracotta warrior head. And, uh, I think he hid it for a while. He didn't want to tell anybody about it. Yes, he felt it might be a, 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 a spirit. A bad thing. A bad thing. But anyway, what happened was the word got out, and uh, for a reward, they gave him a wheelbarrow, apparently, back then. And, uh, but when Bill Clinton visited, when he was in power, he wanted to meet this guy because he was there and asked to meet him. So uh, they taught him a little bit of American and uh, brought him out. And, and uh, now he's employed there signing uh, autographs and posing for pictures if you gave him a two dollar two dollar he'll pose for your picture I only had one dollar I, I showed him my wallet I didn't have any more dollar and he said okay so he would give me half a smile for one dollar <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was inside the building further in and I, he didn't like it because he was uh, couldn't go out and smoke so they, they moved him here so he can go inside and have a smoke and come back Okay, we've uh, now uh, Beijing. We're now in Beijing, and um, again, another modern city, big city. Um, some of the buildings. Gold is for the royal family. So if the royal family, when they built their buildings, like the Forbidden City, you see gold on the roof. That's and red. That's strictly for them. If you built your house with a gold roof, you're done. They, uh, that was not good. It means you're challenging the royal 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 family. This is, a, this is a monastery in Beijing. Another one of the uh, bell towers. This is part of the old wall that doesn't exist anymore. I think we're looking at one of the drum tower. Yep. Now, after one night, we had some time to ourselves. We went out. The wives were shopping. We're standing on the street. And uh, I think somebody came up and asked if we wanted to buy a hooker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 100 yuan for nice girl. 200 yuan, nice girl, speaks English. So what did you say? We said, we said, <laughs> so we, so right we said, no thanks, I don't think our wives would understand. Oh no, nobody need know. We will, you know, and, and I said, no, no, we're okay, we're standing here waiting for our wives. Just then our wives come out of the store and he suddenly clues in. He goes, oh, so many thousands of stories, and he, he kind of scampers off. And he, I mean, he vanished into the woodwork in a microsecond. 
It was great fun. So next day we get the tour of the Forbidden City, and uh, I believe that's Mao's tomb right there. Uh, yeah. And this is Tiananmen Square. Tiananmen means uh, East Gate of the uh, city. And we're going to Forbidden City is just the palace that the emperors had. Anybody see the movie The Last Emperor? Yeah. Well, that's that's basically where he was, and they 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 apparently he had the doorways all had sills about that high. Uh, to stop the evil spirits from coming in. That was their, uh, way, what they believed. And they had those cutouts we could ride his bike through, and that's one of the beliefs they said he, he probably uh, you know, was deposed because of that. And, and there were hardly any people there that day. Only maybe 10, 20,000. So, so that's hardly nothing. Yeah, they can have up to a million people they said in the day. Yeah. And, and everywhere you see people with umbrellas trying to keep cool, and if you try to take their picture, they give you this little V symbol. I think they're all imitating Winston Churchill. Um, but it's, it's apparently good luck. So everybody does that. This is the, in, we're now inside, part of the uh, Forbidden City. All these rooms on the side were for the concubines of the emperor. Yeah, a thousand concubines or something? Oh, something like that. Something like it, that. it took about three years to go the circuit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He would, have, he would finish dinner and they would have a list of who do you want and he would pick which one and they're only allowed an, an hour because he had eunuchs that, that kept care of everything and she can go in for an hour and after an hour she comes out. Nobody gets to stay, spend the night with the AM. Don't retire the poor man out after all. He'd be a customer for the Salamis, wouldn't he? And <laughs> yeah, there you go. But they didn't want the, the females to get control of the emperor, you know, get, to get his heart. They wanted him to stay uh, so he could concentrate on running the uh, country. So no woman got to stay with him more than, uh, more than yeah. an hour. So. I do think it's a great system. <coughs> Similar line. And this that's, is the inner core, yeah. the inner courtyard. That's the palace. That's where his throne is and all that stuff. How big is that courtyard? It's uh, many acres. That's what it looks like. It's yeah. huge. You can see the size of the people and the sides on the sides. Could be a hundred acres. Oh yeah, easy. Yeah, that's a huge, huge area. It was burned some of it uh, in the Anglo uh, Anglo French opium wars. They had that occur as well. The architecture is just beautiful. All marble. You know, build up without a, a single meal. They don't use meal. They just use the wood to put them together. All the, they don't no nails. Meal. No, no meal. Dragon. That's a temple just meal. above. Anybody recognize that? Bird's yeah. nest. Bird's nest, yeah. So we drove, got to drove by. We actually didn't go in and see it, but we drove by and got some pictures. And then we went to the Summer Palace. They had a waterway went from the original palace we just saw to the Summer Palace to this lake. And I can't remember the name of the lake. Do you remember it? Uh, uh, Huning or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so they, they, they used to spend their summer at the Summer Palace, which isn't very far. It's only, you know, maybe 25 kilometers from downtown where the other palace was. And they bring off all us tourists on these dragon boats. That lake is entirely hand dug. This is where our national guy got in a fight with uh, some other guy <laughs> she, over who's getting in the boat first. Yeah, this, this other Chinese guy came up with a whole bunch of Chinese and began, <laughs> began pushing in front of us. And uh, so Chen uh, gave her a real tongue lashing and we got on the next uh, dragon boat. There's a pagoda on the hill, picture of the lake, you can rent a paddle boat or whatever. Yeah, very popular. Some of the palace. Again, yeah, golden roofs for royalty, right? Typical bit of the crowd. Is that Michael Pretty Jackson well. holding his kid out over the mountain? I, I was thinking the same thing, right? <laughs> yeah, it's the same thing. But there's nothing there except a little bit of water. So. And then we, uh, after the Summer Palace, we headed off to uh, north of Beijing to see the Great Wall. 
There's a fake Great Wall as well, that somebody built as a tourist thing before you get to the real Great Wall. <laughs> this is the Great Wall. I couldn't figure out, everybody at work that's been there says, oh man, I climbed the Great Wall, I was just exhausted. And you're going, it's only like 15 meters high. How can you be exhausted going up this little wall, right? But they're talking about going up the hills. Like, look at that. Like, you start hiking up there, and it's already, uh, I think, about you know, 2,500, 3,000 feet elevation. So, so you're uh, hiking up this thing, and it's hot. It wasn't as hot as Shanghai, but it's still, because you're in the north now. Yeah. yeah. There are sections there where it, it's steps, and they're narrow steps. And there's a pipe alongside the steps, so you can grab a hold of the pipe and pull yourself up these steps. It is steep. And uh, right here is uh, the steam issuing from the vent, so we wanted to go down and see that. But we also spent quite a bit of time along the coastline here. Uh, Hawaii, the big island, is very, very scenic. This was taken up on the north coast, where there's a lot more rivers than on the south coast. South coast, the rock is still very porous, and the water just goes straight through. But on the north edge of the island, the rock is much older, and so you get lots of rivers. And they are very, very scenic, and lots of girls walking around. and single piece bikinis, uh, swimming and things like that too. Um, here's the road coming up to Volcano, this is the visitor center up here, this is a little hotel you can stay at. This is a large caldera, this is a very recent caldera, and this is a caldera that goes back about 12, I think, years or so. And uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, this at one time was all molten lava, bubbling and boiling and then froze up and repopulated very quickly flowers everywhere. The, Hawaii is an absolutely enchanted place. Most of these flowers were brought in by people. And very few of them are uh, native to the island. Well, of course, it's a volcanic island, so it, you know, it really was nothing native. Everything had to come in by wind or by sea. Um, but no snakes on the islands either. Pardon? There never used to be snakes on the islands. Yeah. Well, there's, there were never any frogs on the island, and now at night, that's all you hear is the peeping of frogs. The frogs are quite happy. But amazingly enough, I didn't see a single mosquito the entire time I was there. And, and it's rainforest. But uh, no mosquitoes. That, that's pretty tough to take for a Canadian, right? You don't feel at home at all. Anyway, um, this is where the lava's going in. And uh, so uh, there's a core of lava about uh, three meters across pouring in and creating steam explosions, and there's little tornadoes coming off here, and, and you can see pumas falling out, there's stuff splashing into the water. It's rather a, 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 an exciting event to go down and see. Um, and uh, as, as it gets dark, there's just lots of people with their little cell phones and digital cameras and stuff watching as the lava pours in and you see all this uh, activity going on. It's really quite spectacular. Um, here we're couple of kilometers away uh, from the event and there's a piece of old road that the lava flowed across the road and so you drive up onto the lava flow across the lava flow back down onto the road again into a big long parking strip that they've turned the road into and you back in so that you're pointed out so if you do have to leave in a hurry because the wind has changed and now the sulfurous gases are coming straight at you uh, you can get over there in a hurry um, and they insist upon that, and so that's, that's cool. Um, we, uh, we're down here, going up here to Hilo. We did a bit of shopping up in Hilo. Um, and we, of course, we drove up the coast road as well. But we want to come up, and we want to get a, a car up in here and go up on, on Saddle Road and get up to Mauna Kea. Uh, Hilo has the University of Hawaii at Hilo. Quite wonderful people there. Uh, this is the Emola Astronomy Center. The, um, a few Hawaiians, very few, maybe only four or five uh, natives, uh, began to object to the desecration of their sacred mountain by astronomers. Uh, up until the time they started to object, I don't think there was any evidence for any burials up on the island, but they kind of appeared overnight. And the astronomers, in their wisdom, decided to go along with this and make everybody happy. And so this facility is a part of that. It's a public outreach to the Native Islanders uh, to talk to them about their uh, ancient navigation abilities. What's amazing is that the Hawaiians, once they arrived in Hawaii, and they were people who were going back and forth in their canoes all over the Pacific, 
um, using the stars to navigate. The star Arcturus is exactly on the same <coughs> latitude as Hawaii, and Arcturus is Hawaii's star. It goes directly overhead at the zenith. And um, so when, once the Hawaiians arrived on the islands, they went, this is really nice, why leave? And so they didn't, and most of the Hawaiians lost all of their capability to go from island to island and their navigation abilities as old people died off. And so this is really a resurgent, a rebirth of native pride in their astronomical heritage. And it's a great way to justify putting telescopes up on the top of that mountain. Okay, but people still are going, well, we don't want more telescopes than there already are. So, so that's a bit of an issue. Um, there was a great gift store there as well and a wonderful restaurant. And it's right in the immediate area of where all of the institutes for astronomy are, the uh, Subaru and uh, Gemini and CFHT and so on. So if you had business at those various locations, you could go and, uh, and talk to those individuals. Uh, I met for quite a while with uh, one fellow there, uh, who, Gary Fujiwara, Fujihara, wonderful fellow. And he had uh, hurt his back a few days earlier, and so was kind of hurting and wasn't able to help us out too much. Uh, he had been uh, surfing because that big storm was pounding in big waves, and everybody on the island, grumpy if they had to work because there was either work or surfing, and they would much rather be surfing. And there was tons of surfing going on. Um, so we went to Harper's Car and Truck Rentals. If you're going to rent a car you, to go up the top of the other mountain, this is the only place you can do it. And this is the only vehicle you can get, a Ford F-150 with four-wheel drive and hopefully oversized brakes, although they didn't tell me about the oversized brakes. Anyway, uh, it's a massive truck to take up the mountain. So here we are going up Saddle Road. Parts of Saddle Road are very twisty and bendy and steep, and going up isn't too bad, but coming down is, um, is scary, because A, it's probably dark, B, it's raining, C, you can't see the road, D, your brakes are overheating, and you're picking up speed faster than a banshee. So anyway, it's, it's kind of challenging. But it's, uh, everything's got uh, all of these little retro reflectors all over the roadway, so it's like Driving at night is like driving in a computer game. Mm -hmm. There are the domes. That was our first sight from ground, looking up onto the onto the top of the mountain. Very exciting. This is this is Aa, -A, and and you can see the name of this lava is is tells you all about it, right? Walking across that in bare feet, you'd be going Ah Ah, right? That's a good way to remember it. Um, and uh, that's basically what they built the roads through. Um, and there's the Mauna Kea Access Road sign. Now, I'll tell you about the Mauna Kea. There's Saddle Road going there, and there's the Mauna Kea Access sign. And then we're going to come off there and go up this little twisty road and twist up and up and up and across and around and up and go up and then come up to the visitor center. And then to go to the top of the mountain, we'll go on a gravel road uh, for quite a ways. And then we get back on some paved, uh, and then we go back on gravel to get up to the summit. The visitor's information station is six miles basically from Saddle Road and everybody has to stop there to find out what it's like up on the top of the mountain. This is the uh, uh, Onizuka Center for International Astronomy Visitor Information Station. Um, and during the day they have uh, a scope set up for solar observing um, and lots and lots of displays inside and you can buy t-shirts like the one I'm wearing. Uh, for the Gemini telescope, things like that. Um, and uh, there's uh, Ellison uh, Onizuka. Uh, he was the only native Hawaiian, actually Japanese descent, but he's the only Hawaiian who's been uh, an astronaut. And he, of course he was killed uh, in the Challenger uh, disaster. Um, and so they named the, the site after him. Um, so there's uh, just a little shot of the visitor center. Not really many people there when we were there. We uh, stayed there about two and a half to three hours to try to acclimatize the altitude. This is at, uh, and sorry Peter, but this is at 9,300 feet. We're in the U.S., so everything's in feet. Um, 9,300 feet uh, is fine. 
you'd feel exactly the way you do now until you go to walk to your car. And then you go, whoa, that's amazing, right? It, doing stuff is, is, is a bit of an effort. Uh, this is a little, this is looking south, right about there south. And there's this uh, little uh, dome uh, to the south. A lot of people climb that dome uh, in the late afternoon and watch the sunset from there. This is the road going up, and uh, it's all gravel, uh, relatively flat, a little bit of washboard in places where people are trying to break. Uh, nobody speeds going up. Uh, this is up a couple of thousand feet. Uh, you can see Saddle Road coming across. You can see the Mauna Kea Access Road coming up. This is the Access Road going up Mauna Loa, which is on the far side of the valley, and that is to the Weather Observation Center, where they're making all those carbon dioxide atmospheric measurements. Uh, some cinder cones down in the bottom of the valley, and you can sort of see the general nature of the rock uh, surface and uh, Mauna Loa, and, and a deck of clouds going across the, uh, the saddle. And another shot, you can see this is the visitor center down here and the, and the uh, uh, facilities for the astronomers to stay overnight and to, to eat dinner and stuff, the access road going down. And you can see the little path going up to the top of the dome where people can go up and watch. And every night I was there, um, after sunset, and maybe for even two hours after sunset, you see flashlights coming down this hill. And this is a panorama I did. Uh, there's Mauna Loa in the background and uh, the cinder domes and stuff. And a little bit of dust on the road because there's a truck going up. Off-road driving prohibited. The natives love to take their four-wheel drives and go banging around the side of the mountain. Uh, they typically lose tires, lose transmissions, lose oil pans and they leave their vehicle on the side of the mountain. So they decided that wasn't such a good idea, so they prohibited it, and they've stacked extra large rocks alongside the road on both sides to kind of try to prevent that. Uh, the holes, by the way, in the sign are to let the wind blow through, mm -hmm. so the sign doesn't end up in the valley. Uh, Jan took this picture just to give you an idea of, of the, the grade of the road. Uh, it was all the vehicle could do to do 22, kilo, uh, yeah, 22 miles an hour going up the road. Um, and uh, that was pretty much uh, pedal to the metal. Um, yeah, it's a steep road. And a little bit further up the road. This, is, by the way, is a straight stretch. So when you're coming down, uh, you're in first gear and you're trying to keep the vehicle below 50 miles an hour. And the vehicle doesn't want to slow down. First sight of the domes. Oh my God, my heart's pounding. This is exciting. I'm salivating. I'm sweating. It's just like, okay, so there's Keck and, and uh, this uh, little guy, uh, a CSO. We'll talk about that later in Subaru. And uh, another shot uh, through my window. And then we come to this little sign here uh, CFHT, IRTF, and all these names that maybe you don't know about. Uh, Go that way or that way. I don't really know. Protect eyes, and I think it has something to do with the fact that you're now 13,700 feet above sea level, and if you're not wearing a hat and sunscreen and sunglasses, you can get burned. You're going to get burned bad, okay? Because the the UV is very very strong there. As a matter of fact, most of my pictures, because I was not using a UV filter, my bad, were very very blue. And so uh, I had to actually correct the color in all of them, and the computer tended to overcorrect sometimes. So here we are, satellite image, just to give you an idea. We're right here, and we're going to come up this little twisty road, get up on the top. We're going to go past a couple of little observatories up in here uh, to have a look at them. Uh, the, the line, by the way, here, uh, which Google Map likes to put on all the roads, is wrong. Uh, if you did that, you'd be tumbling down the side of the volcano. The road actually goes on this side. <laughs> okay. And so as we're driving up that road, we see the Kex staying there. Uh, twin 10-meter uh, telescopes, very impressive domes. Uh, looking down into the other valley, we see the uh, uh, Caltech uh, submillimeter observatory. Everybody calls it the golf ball. 
Uh, you'll see better uh, why that is later. The James Clerk Maxwell Telescope, which our uh, friend and past president, Gerald Stevens, uh, was working at and still has people going to do observing there, uh, but he doesn't get there too much anymore. And then over here, the submillimeter array. More on all these later. Uh, this dome used to be uh, Air Force, and in 2009, it was given over to the University of Hawaii, uh, now called Hokukia, and it is outreach. They want to have their population, their children, using this telescope remotely, or coming up to the telescope, in fact, and uh, getting more involved in astronomy. So that's what that telescope is currently slated for. So I had heard rumors that people were going to knock this one down, but no, this has been retasked, and uh, they're quite, quite proud of that. So you know, 0.9 meter is not a bad little scope. This is the UK infrared telescope, 3.8 meters across, built up there in 1979. So uh, this is what, 30 years later, right? Nice long time it has been up there. And the University of Hawaii 2.2 meter telescope, 1968, one of the very first telescopes up on the mountain. Uh, very weird dome, the, the shutter comes up and goes across and, and back up in here. So that's where they store the shutter. Um, that's the one they're thinking of tearing down if they no, build the PS4 one. No, 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 they don't want to tear that one down. They really don't want to tear that down. But if they get something bigger, well, all right. <laughs> but yeah, that was the sense I got, is that they did not want to tear it down. Um, another, another view of the scope. Of course, Gemini North, put up there 10 years ago now, which seems almost like yesterday, 8.1 meter mirror. Um, and uh, in 1999, so a wonderful scope, beautiful dome. And uh, here from the other side, you can see the uh, UK scope and, and the Hawaii scope there, and then the, and the big dome. And you get an idea, the impression of how big this is. There's, you know, uh, staircases and a door, mm -hmm. and this is a loading dock for taking big stuff in, and power way over here going in. And there, of course, my favorite telescope on Hawaii, the CFHT, 3.6 meter, put up there in 1979. Um, just a beautiful looking thing, uh, wonderful spot. It's on the north, north end, north, uh, north northwest, really. And so it gets the trade winds going across it, and, and the airflow across it is quite laminar, so they get marvelous seeing. Um, there's Jan for scale, okay? So there's the entrance door right there, and these are snow shedders. These are to shed off the ice and the snow so they don't break the windows. This is the cafeteria right there. And so when I go back, you can see, okay, the, the size of a human, that's, you know, a seven-foot door kind of thing. Uh, it's a very big structure, very, very big structure. And it's actually big enough to hold an eight-meter eight mirror mm -hmm. if they were going to go all as. Right, but of course this is not. This is polar aligned scope. So then we looked across the valley, and there is the Subaru Japanese telescope, uh, eight plus meters. Uh, the two Keks with their interferometric uh, building in between, and the, the NASA IRTF building. I've got an interesting story here. Um, while at the bed and breakfast one morning, uh, a native fella came in and started taking off his clothes, and he had a bathing suit underneath. Thank goodness and he jumped into the pond, uh, the, the pool, swimming pool that they had there. And I was kind of surprised at that. I was, at, at the moment, I, I was out with my GPS, and I was checking the actual latitude, 19 degrees north. And he said, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm just checking the, uh, the, the latitude to just see whether Google Maps was right. And he said, oh, yeah, GPS, yeah, and we use those up at the observatory. And I went, what? Well, you know, yes. He says, yeah. He says, I'm one of the technicians up at the uh, uh, NASA IRTF telescope. Really? So I told him who I was and what I do and stuff, and he told me what he does. And his comment was, uh, gee, I guess we're both on the same tree. You know, his way of saying that we're kind of similar, right, and interesting. He said, well, he says, look, he says, I'm uh, going up in a couple of days to do an observing run. Would you like to come up? and sit in on the observing run. Would I? You bet. So we agreed 
on this particular day that we were going to meet at the IRTF. Okay. So, we go down into uh, Millimeter Valley there. We were looking at the Subaru 8.2 meter telescope there. Put up in 1999. That's a nice big telescope. The entire building rotates at this level. This is where the bearing surface is, right here. So this entire building rotates. This is very similar to the, uh, the uh, MMT telescope uh, on Mount Hopkins in that respect. So the telescope itself, the telescope structure itself, just does the elevation movement. Okay? Like a monster Dobsonia, right? Thinking that's what we should build it thing. Okay. So Keck 1 and 2, um, 1992, 1996, um, dual 10-meter scopes. Uh, this was the only structure that was supposed to be open that day that you could go in and see. And so we drove over and tried to get in. The parking lot is all along here, and this is three big garages. You go into that first garage to get in, and all the lights were off. I could hear the big beast humming. I could hear the little air conditioning fans or something going. I could not see a damn thing. I, I stood there for about three or four minutes, hoping that my dark eyes would dark adapt. I got out my little flashlight, you know, and shone it around, right? I could not see a single thing. I don't know whether that was because of the altitude, but by, the, by this point, my wife is beginning to have heart palpitations, a headache. She's not feeling at all well. And I'm going, oh, crap. So we're standing down at Keck, looking back at, at CFHT and uh, uh, IRTF, and uh, a car pulls in. And I look at my watch, and it's 5 o'clock. This is precisely the time <coughs> that I should have gone over to meet Moses David at IRTF. That's Moses David in the, in the van. I'm at 13,764 feet. My brain is not working. It does not occur to me that I should now go over to IRTF and knock at the door and say, Moses, do you have any oxygen for my wife? Doesn't occur to me, because I'm stupid. I tried to start the car without the keys. I mean, you know, uh, you, you do stupid, stupid things that you normally wouldn't do because your brain's functioning at about 30%. It was really, really weird. So. I'm thinking now, i got to get my wife down the hill because she's really beginning to have some serious issues. She's feeling weak. She's very cranky. Uh, I tell her to breathe deeply. She just bites my face off. Um, it wasn't good. So I thought, okay, got to get her down the hill. Completely forgot about this. My big regret, i got to tell you. But Moses says, next time you're back, we'll, we'll, we'll remedy that. So I took a picture of uh, the, the lineup, IRTF, uh, CFHT, Gemini, Hawaii, uh, UK, and then that little cute guy over there, the 0.9 meter. Yes, Richard? That's the moon there, isn't it? That's the moon, yeah! That's my astronomical content, right? <laughs> and uh, so anyway, so that was my last picture up the top of the hill, basically. We started up. I did take a picture of North Plain. This is, the, this is sort of a plane. It's a little bit <coughs> sloped to these mm -hmm. cinder cones. This is looking north. This is where the TMT, the 30 meter telescope, they hope to put, okay? But they can't put more telescopes on the top of the mountain. We're gonna have to get rid of one. Uh, this is the summit, by the way, uh, and there's no telescopes on the summit. There's a, you can see a little path going up the summit, and it goes up to this little burial mound up there. I don't really know if there's anybody buried up there or not, but the Hawaiians say there is, and nobody's got the gumption to go and do a little bit of an excavation to see whether anybody really is buried up there or whether they just they piled a bunch of rocks and said our king is buried there and you know uh, I think if you were to walk up from sea level to this level it would probably take you a week over that rough terrain if there were no roads and it's my personal opinion that it, what the natives didn't really come at the top of the mountain on a regular basis until there were roads right but now there are paths all over that mountain. And you can go hiking all over that mountain. And the tourist industry is doing that. Anyway, Caltech Submillimeter Observatory. It's a 10.4 metal dish, microwave, basically, but microwave in the 150 gigahertz 
to about 400 gigahertz. So that's, that's below the infrared. And, and certainly in frequencies that up until just 10 years or so ago were basically off limits to our technology. Uh, but 1987 is when they put this up. This is the dish, this is the observatory they're talking about not needing much anymore. There are other ways of doing things that they want to do now. So if they have to get rid of an observatory to put in the TMT, this is the one that goes. Uh, it's in a bit of a valley. It uh, doesn't see the full sky anymore. Okay, but really a neat structure. You can, uh, you can see why it's called the golf ball. Uh, there's the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope, big 15 meter dish, a slightly better surface actually, uh, and uh, also 87. This is the dish that really is doing a lot of work up there now, the submillimeter array. They were actually observing with it while we were there. Um, there are eight six meter dishes put up there in 2003. Um, the dishes, uh, they have this big lead screw that drives it up and down. Uh, and the whole mount rotates. Uh, this very precision surface is very precisely matched to reflect into the second reflector and then down in. Uh, classical Gregorian style. Um, and they're all mount mounted on these precision mounts so those dishes can be moved around into this small cluster uh, or spread out. When they're spread out they act, they have the resolution of a 500 meter dish. 506 I think meter dish. Uh, there's another one uh, sitting on, on home, bay, home plate, basically. So pretty cool device. How do they move them around? I'm sorry? How do they move them around? Uh, they, they have a little vehicle. They come in, they pick it up, and they drag it around and plunk it down on the, on the next uh, home plate. A little vehicle. A little vehicle. Yeah, not much. These things are only about six tons or something. They're mostly aluminum. Kind of like the VLA, except they have rails for them. The VLA has rails, and Alma, down in Chile, uh, has a big, huge transporter, but those are much bigger dishes. Much, much bigger dishes. Okay, so this is driving down the hill, uh, looking back over at Mauna Loa, and the road going down. And the road going down was very interesting, because literally, there's a big sign on the dash of the truck saying, do not ride brakes. And if you do not ride brakes, you're going to get a much speedier descent. Okay, because that truck, that big, huge, massive truck has got a lot of potential gravitational energy that wants to turn into kinetic energy really fast. And uh, I found that terrifying every time I came down. So we came back to the visitor center, and the, by this time they had all sorts of scopes out, little 10-inch uh, dobs and 8-inch dobs and 6-inch dobs. They had a, a LX200 set up. They had an imaging set up, set up. That's the imaging set up. That's an astrophysics mock something or other mount. Uh, who can tell me what kind of camera that is? It's an ST. It's an ST. It's an ST10 with a CFW10 filter wheel. Yeah. There you go. See, that's what now, I was that, the experts, right? Same one I've got. Same one you've got. Okay. And uh, an LX200 <laughs> GPS that actually was collimated, surprisingly enough. This 10-inch, uh, uh, I had a chance to use it. When I, when I first looked through it, it was, oh boy, was it ever off. So very quietly, I just tweaked it up, and then it worked wonderfully. Uh, there was a fellow in here I was talking to, kind of the lead guide, and I said, uh, is Amiga Centauri out tonight or anything like that? He says, oh, no, Amiga Centauri is set. You won't see it. Oh. So anyway, uh, it started getting darker. What's the uh, latitude there? Uh, 19 degrees. 19 degrees. 19 degrees. So, it's starting to get dark, and the sky is transparent. The sky is here to find transparent. Here's the shadow of the, uh, the earth coming up, and we've got this cloud deck down in the saddle, down in the valley. Uh, and it does not come up to the visitor center, hardly ever. And so it might be raining in Hilo, or down the B&B, it might be pouring rain, but up in the visitor center, she's clear skies, we're going to observe again. Right? Well, 364 days out of the year kind of thing. I mean, really. And so what do I spot? What do you think? Jupiter and Venus? No. Those are stars. Alpha and Beta Centaurus. And I'm looking at those and going, cool! Because when I was in Florida at the Texas Star Party, I wanted to see those in the worst damn way. I could see, because of the cloud situation of the TSP, I could see one. 
or I could see the other, but I never did see both together. Yes, Rachel. Question. Uh, how far down can you have to be uh, south on the latitudes in order to see those two stars? Well, I was at 19 degrees south. Uh, uh, to, to do the calculations for how far south, I guess we'd have to get a planetarium program and figure out how much sky That's density and all kind of stuff. But this is Northern Hemisphere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was wonderful. So yeah, Korea would be up higher too than the Florida Keys. Yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah. So anyway, so moon was coming up. This is a full moon night. Okay? I thought, well, you know, we won't see much. Full moon night, right? But it's getting dark. I mean, the sunset was gorgeous. Uh, we didn't see the sunset from the visitor center because it was blocked by bits of mountain. But, uh, you know, the, the sky was getting nice and dark. And this is about a uh, 10 second timed exposure. You can see the clouds down the valley, Alpha, Beta, Centaurus. There's all of Centaurus. And I'm thinking right about there is something I would be interested in right there. And I thought I should look at that a little closer. And sure enough, there's Amiga Centauri above the hill. So I went over and commandeered the 10 inch and got it collimated and focused on this. And I'm just going ooh and ah, and it's gorgeous. And it was really doing a nice thing there. And the chief guy came over, what are you looking at? I said, I'm looking at Amiga Centauri. Really? You can see it? I said, yeah, it's right there. And I pointed in that general direction. He, Let me see. He still didn't believe me. He looked in, he goes, oh, hey, this scope's working pretty good. I said, yeah, I collimated it. Oh, you know something about this? I said, yes. So then we got on good speaking terms. And, and he started showing me things, and I started showing him things. Because even though he was a guide, he really didn't know the sky as well as I'd hoped, which was surprising. Uh, but you can go and volunteer to be a sky guide there. I'll tell you about that if you're interested. So there's, there's the moon and Jupiter uh, coming up uh, over the cloud deck. And uh, they stayed open until about 11.30. And then after everybody had wandered off, I stayed and talked to the, the, to the guides for a while. And they actually gave me a, an application form. They said, look, if you're coming back, we'd love to have you as a tour guide. Matter of fact, I actually gave a sky tour. Um, I was talking to one fellow, one of the Hawaiians, and um, we, we were yapping for a while. And then uh, the, the question kept coming up about Mars in August. And uh, so the tour guide actually said, uh, he was doing a bit of a sky tour, and he said, Dave, would you like to take that question? <laughs> so I took that question, and then uh, you kind of get in with the crowd. It was great. Uh, there were a number of people there who were just wonderful and enthusiastic and keen to learn, right? They were up there to learn more than to guide in some cases. So I intend to go back, and uh, I intend to go back primarily to do observing there. Because uh, it's wonderful. Anyway, that's it. <laughs> Any questions for Mike or I? Richard. Richard. First question. Well, what, of course. Well, what, what trick did you like the best? I mean, there's, there's features in both places that would be interesting to go to. Yeah. Well, Hawaii was a vacation by itself, and so was China. Okay. Yeah. China was very, very busy, um, and uh, really we were getting up early every day and we were going hard and, and uh, seeing tons of stuff. I'm not sure that it was much that was there that we didn't see actually in China. And uh, so every day, Jan would spend about an hour writing down in her diary everything we had done. And we would actually sit down and go through the pictures to remind us of what we'd seen that day because it was so much, you wouldn't remember it all, even that evening. Um, and it was, it was wonderful, and, and I, I think China is incredible, uh, really an amazing place. Um, I felt totally safe there. Uh, there were one or two times when, uh, especially when we were going into Tiananmen Square, the crowds were, were, were big, and at one point we saw a pickpocket take off. He was ahead of us. And he took off, and two policemen were chasing him. And these policemen appeared out of nowhere. And he goes tearing off, and, and there was no way he was going to get away, because he had to go out the doors that a million people are coming in. Yeah. And I don't know how he's going to get pushed past all those people. But... Um,
That was the only time I saw anything that was untoward. Um, I was, we were going down a side street and I photographed a fella cooking some food over a portable charcoal burn. And I photographed him maybe three or four shots and then he realized he was being photographed and he came away from the charcoal burner with his hands up trying to convince me that maybe I shouldn't be taking his picture. I just took more pictures, <laughs> you know. Uh, he was kind of upset with me. I don't care, you know. Go back to your charcoal burner, you know. Um, you apart from that... for pictures of us, too. Like, people want pictures with a uh, Western. Oh, Some yeah. People you know, travel there and they'd see a Western they'd never seen one before, I guess. Yeah, and they wanted pictures of you. And so they'd stand right beside you and some friend would take your picture. And you don't know them and they don't know you, but they want a picture of you. You're standing beside a whitey. Right? We all look alike. So. Yeah, two dollar. <laughs> uh, yeah, we all look alike too, I'm sure you. Uh, we had a great time. And um, I don't need to go back, but I would love to go back. I mean, it, was, it was great, but there's other places that we want to go, right? Uh, Actually, they touched that out from the BBC until they come to India. Um, Chongqing, actually, where we were. We got off the boat in Chongqing, uh, Chongqing, or something like that. And that actually ended up being a pretty good place because it was just slightly hazy there. And we could have stayed there, but we didn't. Um, we, I, we had three buses sitting right beside us. And the original plan was there were roads going in which direction and we could jump on a bus and get to a place that was clear. Uh, but because of a couple of people, particularly Glenn Schneider and Joel uh, Muskowitz, uh, they set up a pile of equipment. I didn't, we didn't show you pictures of Joel's gear. Um, we didn't move, and I kind of regret we didn't move. There was no clear cut, clear place to go either. It wasn't like south because it was higher stuff coming in. And, and the thing is, we should have gone south. Problem is, we were north of the river, and to go south, we would have had to first go east, and then get across the bridge, and then come back, and then go south, and it would have been a pain. So we just stayed where we were. <coughs> we still saw it. It was still impressive. I mean. You're looking at a hole in the sky. That's the best way to describe it. It's a big, glowing hole in the sky, and it is jaw-dropping awesome. Most people either break out in tears or whoop and holler at the top. Whoop and the holler. There was a lot of whoop and holler. Uh, I actually have a video, uh, if you want to see it later. Uh, I don't have time now. Um, I have a video that Joel shot of the entire sequence. He had a, a video camera guided on the sun. And a lot of it's blank, of course, because it's the clouds in front of it. But you hear Joel, come on, give me something! This kind of stuff, right? I have an idea. You and Mike could show this maybe at the Wolf Water Train sometime. Man. You, they wouldn't Man. Man. Okay, let me get over here. Just a quick question, Dave. Sure. When you got back to the visitor center, how long did it take your wife to. Uh, Get really uh, oh, about two minutes. About two minutes. Eh? Yeah, it was really. It was uh, as we came down the mountain, she perked right up. Yeah. And you see something. And uh, she talked about going back up. Uh, I said maybe not. You, you know, testing if you took oxygen, your own oxygen, you get more oxygen. Yeah, if, if you took your own little oxygen tank and you had a little, you know, thing going there in your in your nose. Uh, you'd be fine, okay? Um, I, and I actually checked on the internet to see if I could rent something like that in Hilo or, or Lumera or somewhere, and I didn't find anything, okay? But I was told later that, yes, in most of the observatories, they'll do have a great big green tank sitting there with a regulator, and you can go over and take a few big deep gulps and clear your head, because the scientists and the technicians, <laughs> When they were building one of the domes up there, uh, the technicians who were putting the domes together made stupid mistakes and they'd have to ship this bent steel down the mountain and get new parts shipped back up and try it again. And that was a significant cause for overruns. Um, but the technicians literally, when they're working on stuff, either they're very acclimatized and they can handle it, like Moses was, um, or you know, you're, you're li living on oxygen when you're working up there. It is high enough that you do, you, you really, and the funny thing is, until you do something stupid, you don't feel any different. Yeah, you, don't know. you don't know you're stupid. That's how stupid you are. And that's dangerous. <laughs> okay. I, I tell you one other story. There's locals.
take their, their four-wheel drive trucks up the mountain in the wintertime, fill the back of the truck with snow, and then go down the road to the beach and have snowball fights. <laughs> Problem is, the truck now weighs three or four tons more going down the hill than it did going up. And they'll have a t tendency to lose brakes, and every winter they lose somebody on that mountain. So it's not, it's not child's play. Um, and and uh, Luke Samard, who worked on the mountain uh, last month when he was here, he was tell telling me the stories at the Kelsey's uh, about uh, you know lots and lots of people going off the roads up there in the winter time. And and even the, they'll call a storm, and everybody comes off the mountain. They go down to the visitor center, down to the the residences there, and wait out the storm. And occasionally, if the storms prolonged. They're going, oh crap, you know, our cryostats are drying out. We've got to go back up and fill them up with liquid air again, keep everything cold. So two or three guys will get in a four-wheel drive, go up the hill in the middle of the storm, go into the, all of the observatories, fill up the cryostats, and then come back down the mountain. And they get extra pay for that because it's so damn dangerous. But Luke says, I grew up in Quebec. What's a little snow? <laughs> you know, so it's great. Okay, so remember, I know that nobody has, because nobody's opened up the plastic baggie here, but if you want your name in the box yet one more time, please put your name in, because the draw's going to occur shortly.